Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dean Hintz, and uh, I have Dave Campanis with me, and we're going to talk about uh, FME and uh, CDGML and how to quickly and easily read and write uh, CDGML data with FME. So that's uh, what we look like once we've had enough coffee. And uh, we also have helping us out is uh, Steve McCubb. Um, uh, I think these shops that were from uh, back in November. Uh, and uh, yeah, he's, we're, we will definitely welcome your questions uh, and feedback. Uh, I know that uh, some of the uh, um, Q&A that we have, or the poll questions, I should say, uh, maybe you don't have enough detail on them, and so feel free to give us uh, your specific feedback uh, with the question tool. So we're broadcasting here from uh, sunny Surrey uh, near Vancouver, BC, uh, from Safe Software, and uh, most of you should be familiar with Safe Software. Uh, we're uh, close to 100 people uh, who've been working on. Supporting spatial data translation and transformation with FME. So today, our agenda, uh, we're going to go over um, some basic city GML concepts uh, and how FME supports that. And then we'll look at uh, some details in terms of how to use city GML for reading and writing, uh, some typical workflows. And then we'll dive into demos. Both the reading and Dave's got some good uh, writing demos as well. If we have time, we'll look uh, quickly through a couple of example projects and uh, sort of what's new in 2013 that relates to CityGML uh, and some support uh, resources for you guys. So, as I said, FME is all about uh, powering the flow of spatial data and uh, We've been at this for quite some time. We started off with things like CAD to, to GIS, and then uh, you can see each of these uh, balloons is another family of, of formats that we've supported over time. And uh, while we started with format conversion, we quickly found that as you move, especially as you move between these different families of formats, uh, really the tough part is the data transformation of the spatial uh, data model. And uh, that's certainly the case uh, when you're dealing with, with CDGML. It has a very unique structure. And so in order to load that structure, uh, the integration, the third point, is really key. Uh, being able to bring together CAD, GIS, uh, other XML data, raster data, you know, point cloud, pretty much all of these data sources all into uh, 3D. Um, so it's a very uh, rich data model. So it certainly helps that FME supports more than 300 formats, so that gets you started. And then, of course, there's a lot of tools for uh, transformation. So both the geometry and the attributes, because in this case, actually, what we need to do is we take attribute information and we feed that into the geometry in order to make the geometry model. So, uh, yeah, a lot of tools there for, for transformation. A quick note that if you're new to FME, um, you need, you, there are some resources there to uh, introduce you. So we do assume a certain uh, working knowledge of FME. And if you, if you feel that we're going a bit quick today, I mean, you're welcome. Of course, you're welcome to listen. But if you feel that we're going a bit quick, uh, there are resources available uh, uh, to give you a little more background on FME and FME desktop. So here are some of the prominent uh, 3D formats that FME uh, works with. Uh, certainly CityGML is front and center with that. And uh, then the, there are other ones such as 3D PDF, OBJ, 3D Studio, SketchUp, GeoDatabase, uh, DWG, um, and IFC. So all of these uh, are formats that you might want to consume data from if you're going to make CityGML. Uh, or CityGML may be an exchange format that allows you to move between uh, different proprietary tools. And here's a longer list. And within this list, um, I've also included 
uh, some supporting formats such as Raster. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's, this list is expanding uh, all the time. And uh, yeah, maybe a format, a rash format people might not think of as 3D is, is NetCDF, but that can be used to model rasters in, in 3D. So let's go to a poll question and uh, kick uh, these off here. So what, uh, which formats do you currently work with related to 3D? I'll fire that up. So I'll give you guys a couple minutes or one minute to go through that. So I think, uh, yeah, you can choose one or more of these. Uh, so which ones do you work with, you know, at least every day or at least, uh, you know, weekly or something at that level? Okay, and how many? It's another few seconds here. Okay, we'll close that and show that result. So it looks like uh, we have quite a few of you working with GeoDatabase or Oracle, so some kind of uh, database uh, format for 3D. And that's pretty evenly across uh, the others. Um, Probably, maybe Dave will mention later, but uh, we are looking at uh, potentially for 2014, looking at Revit support for reading. So that's something that's certainly on, on the horizon. And uh, and we're always improving our, our point cloud support. So, um, yeah, uh, all of these are areas where we're working. Okay, so. So in terms of tools that we have for uh, supporting 3D work, uh, format translation is certainly one of the, the, you know, we need to get started. But there's a lot of other tools that FME offers. Uh, and I just mentioned databases. So that's a key use for FME is, is loading uh, databases and extracting from them. So CityGML may be a key transport mechanism for that. Uh, schema mapping is key. Uh, so if you're going from IFC to CDGML, the, the scheme mapping tools we have can certainly help automate that process for transforming the data model. And uh, our OGC support, so beyond CDGML, just our general support for GML profiles such as NAS, uh, Inspire, and of course web services. And uh, then there's, a, of course, the whole range of tools for working with geometry converting the, the geometry model, such as from solid to, to mesh, other geometry transformations and validation, and, uh, and just the fact that we support a very uh, rich geometry model. So ultimately the goal is to turn uh, 2D data, such as CAD plan data like this, into, into 3D data, and, and today's focus being CGML. Now, there, we may also get uh, other data sources, such as from uh, SketchUp and uh, the other very common, common across the industry, of course, is IFC. So, uh, recognizing that often you don't want to start from scratch, uh, so you're going to make use of whatever data is available out there when you're building your, your city model. And then, of course, LiDAR is key for things like uh, building up your terrain or, or vegetation. Uh, landscape. So diving right into CityGML. Um, in terms of the motivation behind it, I know I'm preaching uh, to the converted here, but uh, CityGML does occupy a unique niche because it is at the city level, so it's not quite so focused just on individual buildings, such as uh, you know as IFC might be, and it's not uh, focused at the uh, sort of national global scale like you might in, in Google Earth. Um, so it's really the city level. And uh, it's key in terms of not just being a visualization tool, but actually modeling uh, the whole uh, urban environment, the urban landscape. 
And uh, so Keith there is having this uh, semantic correspondence between the objects themselves and what they mean, uh, both in terms of their attribution and in terms of uh, the geometry. And so uh, application areas include uh, disaster management, uh, uh, urban planning, navigation, transportation, facilities management, architecture, uh, and noise. So you name it. There's a whole very wide range of, of uh, uh, uses for city GML and you know particularly in the areas of simulation analysis having that rich data model behind it certainly helps and I'll give a, a nod to Thomas Colby for uh, some, some of his materials in this uh, presentation. In terms of what uh, city GML is so I, as I mentioned it's exchange format modeling all parts of the virtual city and uh, based on GML3 so it is XML based. Now that's, of course, that's a strength in terms of being an open standard, but as I'll mention later, that does produce, produce some limitations in terms of the size of data sets that you can reasonably work with because it is not uh, spatially indexed. So in terms of the uh, data structure itself, we have these modules, buildings, roads, uh, city furniture, etc. And then there's a correspondence between the semantic object, in this case building, with the type of uh, geom geometry, such as a solid. And so here's a little more detailed diagram showing that geometry semantic uh, correspondence. Composite, composite solid for building and solid for building part. And the other key aspect of CDGML are the levels of detail. So this is really. Um, important, let's say if you wanted to have a web a viewing client uh, that had increasing detail as you zoom in. That's really the, the, the idea here. So that you don't have to overload if you're doing, let's say, an application on the web uh, or just even on the desktop. You might have gigabytes of data, but you only want to have a very simple level of detail when you're zoomed out and as you zoom in, it gets progressively more. Uh, detailed until LOD4 where you have actual interior detail you can actually go inside the buildings. So thanks to uh, Christian Donna from Pantera here for this slide. And uh, other characteristics of CGML, um, external references, so you can have references to things like textures uh, that may be outside of the CGML file. And uh, there are ways of extending city GML. So you can have generic city objects and attributes for things that don't neatly fall into one of the predefined categories. Or uh, a, a more ambitious way of extending city GML is with an ADE, so an application domain extension where you can define an XML schema document uh, that extends um, the functionality of what city GML can support. And an example of that is the noise ADE and also the IMGO uh, ADE done uh, that uh, GeoNova helped facilitate in, in the Netherlands in their effort to go from 2D to 3D uh, mapping. So here's a, just a quick snapshot of that uh, thematic modules from an example data set uh, from uh, uh, Carlsruhe Institute of Tech. Okay, so in terms of our support for CityGML, uh, we support right up to 2.0, which I believe came out uh, as recently as uh, April of last year. And uh, there is a little uh, gotcha there that I noticed even looking for some sample data for today, that if you do have any data created with 1.1, because 1.1 became 2.0, uh, that can cause, cause trouble. Uh, so you can use some of that in there and change the namespace in that version. Uh, we do support ADEs, both in terms of reading and writing. Uh, so this is kind of unique for uh, FME's uh, GML support. For other GML profiles, you actually need, you don't typically have to use a template to write to a, a, a custom application schema. But in the case of CDGML, you just point at the uh, ADE. SSD and you can write to that ADE. Um, and we support all the thematic modules, all the levels of detail, 0 to 4, uh, generic objects, and of course uh, a range of other types of data, it's not, not digital data, metadata. 
So we like to say that we got the best uh, CVG mouse for the planets. Uh, open to uh, anybody who wants to contend that. And that not just in terms of the uh, SEMA, but also in terms of our ability to populate that SEMA with the rich data sources that we can read. So here's a quick snapshot of a, of a typical uh, CVGML document or data set. And so you can see it has the uh, building IDs and name and then the underlying uh, geometries within it. And uh, we'll see some other examples in a minute. So here's how the zoom levels work. Uh, so this is LOD uh, 2 and 1 is basically just sort of like a, a box or just the footprint extruded, um, so no roof detail, and then the LOD zero uh, being uh, just the footprint itself without any height. So this is all one single uh, hierarchical geometry with different views of it. And of course, then you need a, a viewer that have, can that has an LOD slider in order to select different views of that. So here's. Just in terms of comparing the data models quickly, and we'll look at more examples in a minute. But uh, here's what SketchUp data looks like. So you can see here it only has one theme called building, and uh, it has a lot of rendering information. So SketchUp, the focus really is on presentation and visualization. So if we get back to the purpose of CityGML, it's not so good at um, uh, modeling or, or simulation. Uh, if you in terms of IFC, it's much more complex, so it's uh, building focused, and uh, so there's a lot of detail there um, in terms of all of the various components, every door handle, uh, every window pane, it can be modeled. So uh, we're at a much deeper level. And uh, uh, I know we're not selling CityGML, but you could say that uh, in terms of the Goldilocks thing, uh, it's just right, not too hot, not too cold, so not too complex and not too simple in terms of the city scale. But really, the reason why I'm, I'm talking about this now is to illustrate the, the differences in the underlying uh, geometry and attribute models and how that if you want to use one of those other two data sets, you have to map from those to this uh, CGML data model uh, to successfully compose one. So you can see here we have six or seven different theme areas. Uh, buildings, uh, city, uh, floors, wall surfaces, windows. And then on the right, uh, we have both some attributions uh, for IDs, parent IDs. And then within the um, geometry itself, we've got things like the LOD level and the purpose of the geometry. And of course, CityGML supports textures. So, in terms of uh, reading, why don't we? quickly go ahead and have a look at uh, one or two data sets. Um, just before I do, I'll just review a couple of points here on the reader. Typically, we recommend that you have the reader driven by the CityGML schema. <laughs> if you are using an ADE, uh, make sure you specify it here on, um, on the top right. And uh, often ignoring exercise schema location will Will help if you have if you're having any trouble reading a data set. And uh, unless you want a lot of extra feature types, it's best to include only those in the data set. So uh, one feature type per city Gmail class. And here's just another view of what LED looks like. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, uh, jump into a few examples. So here, LOD1, <clears throat> this is very simple. Looking at a data inspector, so of course in 2013, Data Inspector allows you to view 3D, and uh, we've, we're constantly enhancing it, so the performance is getting better and better. Uh, so with the table view now, I, I would really think that most of you would be 
using the data center and not the viewer. And so you can see here that this is a solid and uh, uh, in terms of the attribution city object member and then within the geometry itself uh, you can see that it has the traits LOD1 solid so it's level of detail 1. And if we look at the same object with LOD2 Around. So it's just a house with um, windows, and then of course we can turn on and off um, the ground surface, the roof, the walls, and windows. And you can see through those windows. I guess they're set to transparent, or you turn them off. And so you can see the geometry here now says LOD three, so two or three. I guess because there is a uh, some architectural detail, you can argue this is LD3. And it even has some attribution like uh, the discretion field. Okay, so very simple, starting with a very simple data set, and then of course we can get more complicated. Um, <clears throat> let's have a look here. Inspector again. Oh yeah, I was going to do one other thing before I open this one, just to show you what the underlying XML looks like. So you can see that um, here's a city object member. So it has this is a a building and. Uh, so there's the ID for the building, the description, and then within that, you can see that it's uh, got a wall composed of a wall surface, and the wall surface is composed of uh, polygons, etc. So don't be too scared to look at the XML, especially if you're having trouble reading it. I, mean, I would go ahead and open up your CGML in whatever viewer you're using, or if you're using it, you need to read it and translate it to something else. But if you're having trouble, um, reading it, you might find, let's say, for example, it says uh, CHML 1.1 in here, and that will cause a problem with the, with the namespace. Okay, and let's have a look at something a little bit more, a bit richer data set. Track of the time here. Okay, so this is a downtown uh, data model. I'm not sure if this is Rotterdam, but this is from uh, the 3 pilot from uh, Geonovum. And so you can see that uh, we have downtown buildings uh, that uh, are textured, and uh, we can inspect these individually and see. Okay, this is a wall surface uh, LOD2. So uh, LOD2 meaning we've got uh, detail, roof detail, and potentially uh, texture information. And uh, 29 buildings. Yeah, so the nice thing about uh, our, our um, the data inspector, it does show you that detail of how those are, the geometries are composed. And so this is key if you're Right into city GML, you're not getting the output you expect. You're going to be going, using the viewer to inspect that and see have I set the traits correctly, uh, are the IDs correct, and things like that. So, having this ability to inspect at any level of as deeply as you want within the data model is really important. So, here this polygon uh, is a member of this surface of a wall which ultimately belongs to the building. Now, while we inspect that, I'm just going to show you that uh, how easy it is to work with um, CGML reading. So I'm going to actually run, uh, build, make a workspace from scratch here. 
and translate directly to 3D PDF. I'm going to call this, um, let's just say, March 27th demo uh, PDF. And just make sure I know where that's going. Let's put it on my desktop. So it's just all it's going to do is read the feature types that are in the in the source data set, building and ground circuits, etc., and replicate those in the PDF. So I'm going to go ahead and run that. It's going to take about two minutes. And just back to that model. Yeah, so we can we can look at this at the building level, or we can turn these things off and just take a look at it, the individual modules, let's say bridge service. And examine the traits. So, um, and I've also found that the performance of uh, the inspector has improved a lot, even in the last year. Um, sometimes, if you're dealing with a really large data set, then uh, you might want to consider using a 64 bit. Right now, I'm just using the 2013 release uh, on 32 bit. So, I'm going to go back to the translation. It's writing the PDF file right now. But you can see that, yeah, we need to look at the workspace that was generated. So you can see the building objects and the attributes, how the attributes are read, and uh, and then the how that's replicated in terms of the destination PDF. Now, some of these fields will be reproduced in that point. So you, you know, PDF has certain limitations with attribute writing. Okay, so it should be done in a second. There's the, I think that's it there. It's popped up. That's not quite done yet. There we go. Just take a second to open. So this is the um, C model. Uh, just in the 3 PDF. And why bother showing a PDF when we're talking about CGML? Well, CGML really is, uh, its strength is a, as a transport uh, or exchange format, but not everybody out there is going to be able to work with CGML. So if you have um, uh, 3D data online and you want to make it available to the public, this is one good way to use. Uh, you might also want to use KML, so uh, right to Collada, Write your 3D model to KML, and the uh, KML writer will automatically generate a collage model um, within the KML. And in fact, you can see that a lot of the details are preserved as well. Okay, so that's that so demo. And last but not least, uh, really, really quickly, uh, again a nod to the uh, 3D IMGO uh, 3D pilot from the Netherlands. Uh, in terms of our support for, um, yeah, here we go. In terms of our support for ADEs, so I can I can read this data, but if I try to read it, well, for sake of time, I won't do it. If I try to read it without the um, the ADE schema, I'm not going to get any of the uh, ADE feature types. So I'm going to pull in that schema here. So there's the IMGO um, application domain extension. And so this is the output of a 2D to 3D conversion. And uh, so the input data, um, Holland is basically uh, moving from um, 2D base mapping. So for the whole, at the national scale, they're going to move to 3D base mapping. And so that's why they came up with the IMGO data model. So a lot of the uh, layers have been localized. Turn this off here. Okay. 
Oh, okay. So here's the data. <clears throat> so it's basically a city, I think this is the Den Bosch area of uh, Southern Netherlands. And so you can see it's at the city scale. And uh, we can click on individual buildings and see that uh, data model. And which looks like typical city GML, except now we have all these IMGOs. So we have uh, specific traits and attributes uh, related to the, the Dutch schema. So they've extended it. They've also um, added a bunch of their own modules, water deal, because of course water is pretty important to in the Netherlands. And, uh, and then they have their own spelling for some of the um, uh, theme names, like out, outbuildings and whatnot. So there's just an example of uh, using an, an AEE application domain extension. Okay, so just wrapping up then in terms of reading, and then we'll, I'll hand it over to Dave. Um, so we, we basically looked at CityGML in an XML editor, which is a good way to diagnose things if you're having trouble uh, reading. Uh, we looked at uh, different levels of detail and uh, different CDGML themes and geometry structure. And we also looked at an example of a uh, data and application domain extension. Okay, so uh, you guys have seen uh, different levels of detail. Just a couple of other snapshots here. So it's a bridge in LOD1 and the same bridge in LOD3. And uh, we don't really have the time to get into too many other workflows, but uh, uh, they will show you a few in terms of uh, writing CityGML. Um, so as I just mentioned, going from 2D to 3D, uh, and often a big part of workflow will be good. When you're going from 2D to 3D, you've got to uh, write out the various surfaces for LOD0 or for the landscape, and then extrude to 3D for things like uh, buildings. And uh, I'll review this later in terms of some of the key transformers for supporting 3D. Okay, so let's do a poll before we pass it over to Dave. So what typical operations do you need to support um, uh, your work with city uh, Gmail data? So we need to find that poll. So just give you guys a couple, a minute or so to respond to that. So are you predominantly reading CDGML? Uh, do you do a lot of writing or updating of it? And uh, do you work with you know, migrating from 2D to 3D? And then, um, or quality assurance is basically like extraction. So those are your choices. Another 10 seconds or so. Just making sure you guys are still awake so I haven't lulled you back to sleep. Okay. Okay, we're going to close that now. So it looks like uh, quite a few of you are using FME to, to read city Gmail data. Um, uh, oh, look, quite an end writing. And the big, actually, uh, yeah, it looks like a big theme there is going from 2D to 3D. So it's good if we have, have some. Okay, moving on. Okay, so just a, one or two quick notes about writing, and then I'll hand it over to Dave. Um, certainly, you do need a good knowledge of the CDGML specification in order to successfully write it. There is a link there to the uh, uh, CDGML spec uh, at geospatial.org. <coughs> And uh, there's also a good tutorial in the readers and writers docs yeah, within that. <clears throat> Key is setting a CGML LD name. So there's a naming convention. You have to be very, very carefully followed. So saying whether it's an LD, what level, LD1 solid, <clears throat> LD2 multi surface, etc. So you have to set that. And then there's a feature role that, that needs to be set. And the other key is making sure your IDs and parent IDs all correlate properly so that your wall services should have a Gmail parent ID that corresponds to the building that it belongs to. 
And you'll see this pattern over and over where you have an attribute setter followed by a geometry uh, property setter and another attribute setter and a property setter. So uh, we need, typically you create the attribute and then you can set it on the geometry and property setter. And just, just to note that uh, the name does need to be exact and it is, is case sensitive. And uh, as a review from the previous slide, you're going to see a lot of uh, active creators, uh, property setters, things like 3D forcers, uh, extruder, and geometry coarser. So those keep coming up again and again. Um, and yeah, here's again another snapshot of, of uh, the destination feature type and how that corresponds in the CGML itself. And uh, yeah, you can use an attribute setter or you can even directly set them on the destination, but I think using the transform is probably cleaner. Okay, so I won't bother you with <laughs> um, those workspaces. This is a, um, we don't have time to get into the detail, but here's the correspondence between IFC and CGML and the different representations of them, one being essentially uh, a constructive solid geometry, and the other one being a boundary. CGML is a uh, the rep or boundary representation. So it's a very different data model and the workflow um, reading the IFCs. The schema mapping really is key there to, to read map from the IFC to the CGML types and generate the correct LODs and IDs. And so this is the result. Okay, so handing it over to Dave, just a sec here. Okay, good morning. Um, I just want to show you some practical examples of how to write uh, city GML files. I'm going to have to do three examples and it's going to range from the fairly simplistic up to a slightly more complex. Um, our first example, or I should say before we start the examples, if you're writing city GML, there is one resource you really cannot do without and that is, if you go into the FME desktop help under the City GML Reader Writer, uh, there's a tutorial that writing City GML from FME. I never write a City GML file without having this open. Um, it's nice, not only does it cover the, the basics of writing the City GML, but at the bottom are some required tables to tell you the valid LOD types for your feature types and also your, your valid geometries and your feature roles. Uh, also helpful sometimes if you're setting certain attributes is the uh, CityGML specs, which also have um, sort of tables at the end to show you the various uh, uh, attribute settings. Okay, for my first example, we're going to start off with a basic SketchUp file. Uh, this is just one I've downloaded from Google Warehouse. So it's a fairly familiar building. Um, this is going to be LOD2. Since it has no windows and doors, um, that's all just represented by textures. It's essentially got two components here. It's got a ground model and a building model. We're going to grab both of these, uh, set the ground model to land use and the building model to uh, building. Uh, one interesting thing about this model is that it has, uh, in it, it is grouped. So it kind of has a multi-level structure that we're going to have to deal with as a uh, part of the translation. So that's the model as it begins. Let's switch over to the workspace. So here's a fairly simple workspace. We're bringing in our SketchUp data and we're outputting to land use and building at the city GML. All along the way, we, we do a few manipulations. Um, Dean earlier talked about the attribute creator and geometry setter pair. To make things easier for me, what I've done is I've wrapped these two in a custom transformer and set some published parameters with the um, making it a choice of all the sort of valid values. So it cuts down on the typing and on the, the amount of sort of typos you can have. Um, 
and then you can use this uh, everywhere where you need to set the city gmail geometry and then you can just pick your your settings um, from the parameters um, this was just recently created what I will probably do is publish it out to FME store for you guys so it will be available for anyone to use just it speeds things up a little okay so getting into the purpose of the workspace we have our city GML uh, data coming in from SketchUp. Now when FME reads a SketchUp model, it reads the entire model as a single feature. So all of the building and the ground surface is all a part of a, a single aggregate. So before, in the old days, what we, we do is de-aggregate, extract things we want, re-aggregate back up to make the, the, the multi-surface again. But we have some new tools in FME 2013. Uh, one of them is the Geometry Part Extractor. And this one's kind of nifty. It allows you to extract a part of your underlying geometry using a, a, a geometry query. So in this case, I'm going to I'm looking to extract the ground surface. So I've examined uh, the, the geometry, and uh, I know that the ground surface has a trait called Google Earth Snapshot that is set to 1, and its geometry type is an FME face. So I set those tests. I make it an AND, and now it's going to extract any uh, geometry that fits that condition. So after the extractor, I set the city GM, GML geometry, and this, unfortunately, uh, when you read a SketchUp file, it does come in with a coordinate system, and it's a custom coordinate system based on the lat long location of the SketchUp file. Um, the geometry extractor in this version of FME when you extract a part, it actually strips that coordinate system off. This has been fixed, and that fix will be available in Service Pack 2. But in the meantime, all I've done is I've reset the coordinate system to the SketchUp coordinate system 0, which is always the name of the generated coordinate system. So that's just to restore the coordinate system on my output. So that's the land use, and it's very simple land use. I haven't set any categories uh, on land use at all. The second string is for the building. Now, I use a copy of that first geometry extractor, but in this case, I remove that ground surface using exactly the same query. And I'm saying, okay, in the, in the first one I've extracted it to use here, I'm saying get rid of it. We'll just keep all the building information. The uh, next thing I do is, as I showed in the, the SketchUp model, is grouped. So it has a kind of multi level aggregate geometry. Uh, which really does not fit well with basic building geometry in CityGML. So I use a deaggregator and I tell the deaggregator to flatten all levels. So it's going to take all this multi level aggregate structure and just split it all down to its component faces. And then I aggregate it back up together into a single multi surface. So I've, I've essentially flattened out the entire model. And then again, we set the, the city GML geometry. Now, in this case, I set an LOD to multi-surface, and it's the, the, the basic building geometry, so it's going to be a city object member. Uh, on the land use, I essentially did the same thing. So now when you run this, the output is essentially that this is this I'm using the land explorer Autodesk land explorer city GML viewer just to show you what our output looks like in, in, in other people's products so we can see that your city GML output looks pretty much exactly the same as our sketchup input so I call that a successful translation now the next slightly more complex translation is we are going to try, we're going to create an LOD1 model um, of buildings uh, in the city using an input shapefile. Now the shapefile is all 2D and it is broken down, uh, this is uh, the city of Trento in Italy, and it's broken down unfortunately in Italian, but thanks to Google Translate we can figure out what things are. Uh, another little plus is that they actually also have an English translation on their areas. So you can see we have railway areas, we have buildings, we have roads. Uh, the key thing about the buildings is they have a height value here that we are going to extract and use to create um, proper uh, building polygon or building um, shapes. 
So let's skip to the workspace. And here is slightly more complex and we are setting uh, a number of different types of features. Um, we are setting railway features, road features, water bodies, land use, and buildings. Um, I use an attribute filter to filter by the, uh, the type. Again, in Italian, uh, I apologize, but again, Google Translate is very handy. The, mo the simplest ones to deal with are the transportation, just railway and road. All they require is set a setting to LOD1 multi-surface and city object member. Um, for the water bodies, we, I decided to go a little bit more complex and we set an attribute the class to 1030 which is river. So we're setting a river class on that and again multi-surface and city object member before writing out to the water body. The vegetation comes in from four different layers. Uh, we have woods, we have orchards, uh, grassland and vineyards. Um, we use a attribute value mapper to map the various um, output types, output classes. We also set some more classes here. Um, again, we set the LED1 multi-surface city object member and it goes up to land use. Now the buildings are the, are the most interesting. We have three different types of buildings. We have basic buildings, we have churches, and we have warehouses. For the churches and the warehouses, we set their class to the correct one for that. And the classes I've been essentially looking up within the city GML specs here. Now for the buildings also have the, uh, the building height in them, but not a really convenient way. They're, they're essentially buried in this attribute here. So it's building H23.5M area, et cetera, et cetera. So what we want to do is just extract that number from this entire attribute. To do that, we use a string searcher transformer. This allows you to set a regular expression that will extract uh, just the, the heights. So I know that the height lies between an H and an M. And I set up a little regular expression to, to essentially take any number that's separated by, or may or may not be separated by a period and some decimals. And by wrapping it in these round brackets here, I say just extract a number, don't, use the, don't, don't keep the H and the M. And those extracted values will go into a, 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 a match parts attribute, which is actually a list. Um, now that I've extracted that attribute, I want to send it to an extruder. Now an extruder, I'm telling it to extrude by height and to set its height to that matched parts, which is the actual height of the building. Um, again, in this case, we set lowly do one multi-surface to the object member and we write out to building. So now we're writing out all these features to a city GML file and let's look at the results. I'm using here uh, the FZK viewer, which is a free viewer from I think the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. And this shows you the output in city GML. We have our rivers, we have our railways, we have our roads, and we have now our 3D buildings. And this can be or maybe not, kind of slow response here. So that is, oh, there we go. So fairly slow rotation uh, on my little laptop here. It's a, it's a very large model, but we have essentially a, now a full 3D model created from 2D data. Now the third example is we're gonna do something a little more, even more complex, and I'm gonna try to create an LOD4 model, which is a building with interior uh, features as well. And again, for this data for this, I essentially went on Google uh, Warehouse and grabbed uh, a random um, suburban building with interior detail. Now this, this required a little bit of preparation um, in that everything in this model was on the same layer. So that wasn't very helpful. So I spent a little time in SketchUp and 
basically set the layer of the various features to what they actually were. So we have ceiling layer. I grabbed everything that was a ceiling, uh, put it on the ceiling, grabbed all the deck stuff, put it on the deck, etc. cetera. Um, so this is kind of necessary. It, I mean, might be possible to do some of this FME with some complex filters, but in some cases, it's, it's really just easiest to go and fix the, the model to begin with. So now that I've, I've set up the different layers in the model, we're going to use those in the workspace to separate to the different features. So this, before the buildings I was created, was a building with a single geometry, uh, so which is attached to the building itself. In this case, we're going to be building up that building geometry through the different building parts, like uh, building part, roof surface, ceiling surface, interior wall surface, etc. In that case, we still need a building feature, but it doesn't require any geometry. Really, all it needs is an ID. So I take the, the main building, I strip the geometry from it. I set it to LED for multi-surface. Actually, that should be city object member. There we go. And I create now I create a building ID from essentially the base name of the uh, of the building. So the, the file name preface by FME. Now it's important that you you pick a building name that's sort of easy to to use uh, again because on all these other features we're going to be setting that same building name as the parent ID. So here we set it as a GML ID and these other features we're going to be setting it as the parent ID so they're correctly linked, all the wall surfaces are correctly linked to the right building. So that's the, the building stream. Now the other stream is all the, the surfaces themselves. First thing we do is we want to de-aggregate it and break up that, like I said, the SketchUp model comes in a single piece. We want to get, break it up into its multiple pieces so we can separate it. Uh, we just create a little GML ID for it. And we, the reason we do this up front is that we're going to be using this a little bit later on because the openings are, uh, the doors and windows are also going to be attached to the walls instead of the buildings themselves. The next step is to get the SketchUp layer that I said in the SketchUp file. Now, these layers are traits on the geometry rather than attributes on the feature. So we use an, uh, a transformer called the Geometry Property Extractor to extract that trait up into uh, a proper attribute so that we can, we can uh, root in the attribute filter later. Um, now, I've aggregate, I sort of grouped, I grouped the pieces within SketchUp so that these traits come through as a list because it's a list of traits on the individual geometry. So the first thing I have to do is I expose the list and then I index the list because they're all going, I know they're all going to be the same, that the, all the roof features are going to be in a, in a, in a single feature. So I know that the, the first value in the list is going to be the same as all the rest of the values. Now, I'm not very good with SketchUp, and I've made a few mistakes in that model, and I created some bad geometry. So we have some uh, interesting tools here. We're going to use that geometry part extractor to extract uh, some features that um, that's, that uh, City Gmail cannot handle. SketchUp uses lines a lot to sort of delineate the edges of their surfaces, and we can't use those in, in City Gmail. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of all of uh, the lines. And I know the lines are, have their entity na type name of edge. And, and uh, there's also component instances in there which are essentially empty. I don't know how they got in there. Like I said, I'm not that good at SketchUp. But we can use this geometry part extractor to extract uh, things we don't really need. The other thing is that um, in extracting some of the, the, the lines we didn't need, these lines were grouped in and of, of themselves, and when you extract the lines, you end up with an empty group, which is a, a, a null aggregate, um, which isn't very good uh, and will, will confuse the city GML writer. So we have a nifty, another nifty little transformer called the Geometry Validator. And this is very handy if you're unsure about the quality of your geometry or if you've done something you've extracted, you may have, you may have messed something up. So I'm running this through the Geometry Validator and I'm just getting rid of, I'm telling it to fix some issues that we might run into. NANs or infinities, sure, let's, let's, let's see if there's some missing uh, um, 
um, coordinate values. Um, let's get rid of all the null geometries. Are there any degenerate or corrupt geometries? Possibly. Let's get rid of those as well. Now, after I fix those, uh, if it finds a null aggregate and it fixes it, what it's going to do is bop it down to a, a null geometry. But again, we don't want any null geometries in our output. So I'm using geometry part extractor just to get rid of the, the null geometries that might have been created by the validator. So here's a little sort of QA process that you can do on your geometry, get it all nice and clean without having to say go in and fix it manually. The next step is to filter by the, uh, the SketchUp layer that we've extracted into the, the various uh, sections. Um, the first section is simple, that's just the driveway, garden, lawn. Those are all city, um, city objects. So the traffic area in this case, uh, city object member. The next set are actually parts of the building themselves and those are set to multi-surface and consist of building part or uh, bounded by. And again, the proper settings for the proper features can be found in the, the tutorial um, tables at the bottom. Now, the, the next step is to tie these building parts to the, the actual building itself. And in this case, since um, the building ID was created from the file name, it's easily enough to create a GML parent ID and set it to the same, same value so that these, these parent IDs now automatically all point to the building ID. However, for the door and windows, it's a little bit more complex. Since they're not tied to the building, they're actually at another level and they're tied to the wall surface. Now, I cheated a little to make this easier and I just turned the wall surface into one big piece, the exterior wall surface into one big piece. To, to simplify the process a bit. So what I do is I take a copy of the exterior wall here and I run it down into, I just create an attribute creator and I say, let's create a fake join ID and set the GML parent ID to the same as a GML ID. So now we're, we're, we're creating a parent ID that's the same as its original wall ID. I use an attribute creator or attribute keeper to dispose of all the attributes except for that parent ID and the fake join attribute to ensure that nothing else gets joined to the, the walls and the doors. And the walls and the doors, again, I create a, a fake join ID. And then I use a feature merger to merge that, uh, that GML parent ID onto the doors and the windows before writing them out. So now the doors and the windows will be attached to the walls, which are then in themselves attached to the buildings. Now the output to that is, we see our house here in the viewer. And if we look at the structure of the house, we have our land use and we have our building. Uh, the, within our building, we have the, the different pieces of the building. And now within our wall surface, we also have the windows and doors. So everything is hooked up correctly and it's a proper LOD4. If we turn off the roof here, we can see we have the interior detail as well. And it all comes over, the textures all come over. So that's about the end, end of my demos. Um, I think we just pretty much scratched the surface of City GML writing. If you want to write any more complex uh, City GML models or if you run into problem, problems, please feel free to contact uh, me at support at safe.com and I'd be happy to, to help you through the, the difficulties. And I think that is it for the demo. So back to you, Dean. So we saw some good examples there of, of how to read all those different uh, data sources. Um, many of a lot of that being 2D data and then assembled in 3D and of course reading from SketchUp and going to see GML. And uh, yeah, one of the key concepts there is that might be new to you that are used to traditional FME and haven't worked much with uh, 3D data is this idea of labeling components of the geometry. So those labels within the geometry, those are, are traits, geometry traits. I uh, don't have too much time left, so uh, we'll wrap it up in the next couple of minutes. Uh, just bear with me. And, uh, you know, these are just a list of some projects that have used uh, FME's abilities with CityGML. And, uh, you know, some few snapshots here, the uh, noise directives, the EU environmental noise directives, so the noise ADE, um, a 3D city model for Carlsruhe. 
And there's more information. This presentation uh, will be available uh, and sent out to you guys afterwards. So if I've had to fly through these, uh, uh, there's, there's information to get more uh, details on any of these projects. Uh, the city of Nuremberg, uh, I work quite a bit on uh, three pilot, you know, it's data from that. So this is the uh three pilot in Netherlands, which is a big effort to move from 2E to 3E. And we saw some data from that already. And here's a snapshot of the 2D data, which is actually 2D in CGML, and then extruding the buildings uh, to 3D and draping uh, the land surface areas on the DPM. And an example of uh, <coughs> output in, in PDF. There's also uh, the C, the 3D uh, model of Berlin, and there's a uh, uh, 3D CDDB project around that. And uh, so the entire uh, city of uh, Berlin has been modeled in 3D. And so uh, CDGML is essentially used as the transport of the load format. So both for loading the database and for exporting from, from the database. I believe the project itself centers around the network uh, schema for modeling that. That is uh, based on CGML. And looking forward, uh, we, uh, we do anticipate there will be some kind of uh, Inspire ADE. Uh, and if once that comes out, we'll be sure to support it. Now, in terms of 2013, uh, Dave already talked about uh, geometry. Validation repair is a good example of that. There are also new tools for analysis. Uh, there's a volume calculator, which can be good for QA. So if you notice you're trying to build uh, volumes and you know, expect all your buildings have to be at least uh, you know, five cubic meters or bigger, it's you know, if you're fragments, you will be able to filter those out. And we don't have time to get into it today, but uh, certainly FME can be used to support data distribution over the web. Um, by FME server, and there's a whole range of, of power around uh, consuming point clouds and transforming those into surfaces or using them for height information for building extrusion. So we've already seen the uh, validation, uh, and we've seen a little bit about, uh, they, they use a number of examples of, of what we call G query, so it's an X query that allows you to modify uh, and filter out or filter in. Uh, geometry components without having to de-aggregate them. So it's a very powerful tool. I certainly look for articles on this on FMPDF. And doing things like uh, uh, you know, slope analysis, area analysis for, in this case, uh, load risk. So I'll just run through one or two quick polls before we wrap up. Always looking to get your feedback. Um, what is your biggest challenge when, we, when you're working with uh, CGML, specifically within FME? Um, so please uh, let us know, and um, uh, yeah, we're always interested in your feedback in terms of where where we can invest. I think we're doing better all the time in the area of performance, and uh, we are also pushing through the 3D capabilities of FME. So uh, there, you, you can do 3D clipping now, for example, but it only works with uh, volumes. You need one volume to clip another one. So service looking might be an area where that might uh, be useful. Uh, so I'll just give you another couple of seconds to respond there. Okay, that's enough time. Show you the results. Okay, so some of the complexity of CDGML, that's certainly an issue. And there, there may be ways over time that we can uh, sim simplify a little bit of that. And one other quick uh, question here. On uh, additional functionality, uh, where can we improve FME? So it's a kind of a related question. So uh, you know, maybe maybe more uh, BIM support. So we're we're certainly working on that. Uh, it's always a challenge to improve and update our, our documentation and give more examples on FME PDF, um, streamlining the CG writing and. Uh, Improving our, our handling of, of 3D and 2.5D. Okay. So there's the results there. So, yeah, th thanks a lot for your feedback. And certainly, if you do have any uh, questions, uh, I know it's hitting just about to wrap up, but if you fire off any questions to us, uh, either in the context of this webinar 
or to support it safe, uh, we'll be sure, sure to get back to it. Okay, so just to wrap up then, um, so I mentioned data distribution via server or PML. Uh, so there's a number of challenges working with uh, CDGML data, and certainly we're hoping that uh, as FME develops, we will be able to address those. So just to wrap up that, um, CDGML is certainly an ideal format for modeling uh, the SC or city scale in 3D, and it's also very good for exchanging 3D data between different environments. So, uh, we're a little bit slow in North America to pick up on this, but uh, you know, certainly uh, got started in Europe, but I think it's becoming more and more prominent here in North America as well, and elsewhere in the world, Asia, Pacific region. And uh, one of the good benefits of CGML being that it's not uh, vendor or proprietary, so uh, if you invest in it for exchanging data, you don't have to worry about uh, uh, it getting locked down or, or license fees. Um, FME is an ideal tool to support it because of the wide range of formats and the transformation capabilities that we support. And uh, we certainly do support the latest version of CGML, uh, levels of detail, all thematic modules, uh, generic objects, and of course, uh, new in 2013, the application domain extensions. And uh, yeah, the uh, certainly don't forget about FME server for automation and the enterprise or web services. And we, you know, over time we're committed to supporting uh, CDGML and uh, uh, application domains as they evolve. So here's just a snapshot of some resources. Again, uh, you don't have to jot these down in the next 10 seconds. Uh, uh, these will be available when you circulate the, the, the presentation. Um, so, uh, and again, th thanks to uh, uh, Thomas Colby for so there's additional resources from him available at cdgml.org, uh, safe.com, FDPDF. Uh, Dave mentioned the CDGML specs and of course the readers and writers manual. Also, don't forget about the world tour coming to see uh, me or you and uh, you can grill us with your 3D questions when we, when we arrive. Uh, a couple of upcoming webinars on uh, Teradata and PostGIS. Those just might be of interest for some of you. And I think we've, we're pretty much out of time, so we'll be following up with you. So just thanks from uh, Dave and Steve and myself uh, for your time. Also, thanks to Christian Domino of Quintero because he provided some valuable resources for, for this talk. And there's our, our contact information. Um, support at SAFE, or you can go to safe.com slash support and use the web form. So we look forward to uh, uh, seeing some of you on the world tour coming up. And certainly thank you for your, your time and any feedback that you have. We want to make, you know, FME is a powerful tool. We can always make it better. And uh, certainly it's a lot of fun working with 3D data. It's a, you know, it's a good way to, to wow your friends, uh, to show off uh, some, of, some of the, the data sets that you're working with, but uh, uh, also just the ability that FME gives you to just make that work uh, flows that much easier. Uh, so again, thanks for your time and uh, uh, we look forward to hearing from you and uh, seeing you on our next webinar.